Okay, thank you very much for coming here this afternoon. Let me first introduce myself. My name is Ahlam Salame, and I'm, I'm an assistant professor. Uh, and today is really my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Uh, Robert Seinberg. Um, actually, I met uh, Bob um, in 2021 when I did uh, the Tiger Award uh, Writing Award, and I met him there. He was one of my mentors. Uh, mentors and I was really happy to work with him. Uh, he was um, not just helping me to write the grant, he was also like giving me all these interesting questions to think about it in terms of my research and how to proceed from there. But what happened is like each time I go to ASNR, I, I just happen to meet him and see him again. And uh, each time I meet him, um, I learn a lot from him. So uh, I feel really um, like it's really nice to be the one who's introduced him or um, actually inviting him to come here to Cleveland. So what Bob is going to talk to us today is about um, his research with this very interesting type of research. So he's a, um, uh, he come to the, uh, the research career from uh, as a clinician. He did his uh, undergraduate as an occupational therapist. Then he continued his degrees immediately after he finished his undergraduate. He did a master in physiology and neurobiology. Then he did a PhD in neuroscience. And then he did his postdoc in Columbia University in neurobiology. And um, his research is really one of the pioneers who's thinking about uh, letterization, which means like dominant versus non-dominant hand. And what he found uh, while he was doing this research, that the dominant hemisphere actually is, is very good in predicting the aspect of executing the smooth and kind of like uh, accurate movement, but the undominant hemisphere has a different way, especially in unpredicted movement. So it's really interesting that he was able to show that we we don't use as now I'm talking, I'm not using one hand, it's actually we're using as human, we're using both hands usually in our everyday task. So it's really, we're going to learn today from him is how is that, why is that important and how can we use that to help people who have a stroke to improve their arm function in the arm that is affected. Uh, he has a very impressive CV, very, very, really long list of publications uh, where he actually like been doing this uh, for a really long time. Not just that, he published and he actually wrote a lot of chapters, book chapters about um, uh, motor movement. Um, as I mentioned, I was really happy uh, to meet him and uh, be able to know him. And I'm very excited to learn more today about his talk. So without further ado, please uh, say hi to Bob. Bob. Thank you. All right, so everybody can hear me, right? A little too much. Um, all right, so I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about that crap. Handedness and brain lateralization. But I'm also going to talk to you about why we treat the wrong hand in stroke. And the reason I have Wallace and Gromit here, raise your hand if you ever saw a Wallace and Gromit movie. Yeah, good group. You know the intellectuals because they've seen Wallace and Gromit. Well, my friends, like Jules DeWald, Bob Kirsch never said this to me, but uh, uh, at some point in my career, they told me, Bob, you're working with the wrong hand. And it reminded me of the Wrong Trousers movie by Wallace and Gromit, which is why this is on here. And, you know, the, the, the end of the story is they were probably right and I probably should have left science. Um, so what I'm going to do, uh, doesn't fit too well on here. Um, is there any way to change that? Because that's going to happen with all the slides. I mean, I see it fit on here. Who am I talking to? Behind the light. Anyhow, I'll keep going and maybe they can change it. Um, so what I think is kind of important about the talk is, like, I saw a lot of super impressive work here today. And you guys are doing a lot of work that's, a, that's both applied and to some degree basic. And I think that when we think about the word translation and translational science, we're trying to put together basic science with applications. So the basic stuff informs what we do in the clinic. And I'm going to give you a, you know, a fairly crappy example of that. Um, and, <laughs> and so I'm going to talk about mechanisms of motor lateralization, lateralized mechanisms in pathology, and then clinical intervention. And I even threw in a couple of slides on 
stimulation because you guys are into electrical stimulation. They might not fit, but I threw them in there. So basic mechanisms of motor lateralization. It's kind of interesting. If you think about the, the nervous system, um, if you were going to engineer a control system like this, you wouldn't duplicate everything on each side. So if you had to do something like thinking, um, you know, imagining, you wouldn't put an imagining module here and imagining module here. Because that would be a waste of neurons, because you only have so many neurons you can deal with. And there's, uh, I won't get into it, but what you would do is you would have something over here. If it's connected to the periphery over here, then it would be very symmetric with the part that's connected over here. So primary uh, brain areas are symmetric, they're not lateralized, they're cross innervated, whether it's the visual system or the other system, that, that's not lateralization, they're symmetric. You know, your, your, your primary somatosensory cortex, your primary motor cortex over on this side, controlling this crap, and over on this side, controlling this crap, are symmetrical, they do the same thing. But when you get to the upper level things, where you don't have to be directly connected to the periphery, then you see lateralization in pretty much all the systems where one side of the brain does something different from the other side. Beautiful, thank you so much. Now you can see the whole slide, which is probably a deficit for you. Um, so, you know, this isn't just in humans. Lateralization has occurred throughout the animal kingdom since the beginning of evolution theoretically, and Leslie Rogers and Peter McNeilage have kind of coined this field comparative vertebrae lateralization, and kind of interesting what they've done. It doesn't fit into left-right because different species have different things lateralized to different sides, but what they did when they looked across species across the animal kingdom, they came up with one hemisphere that deals with ordinary and familiar circumstances and the other hemisphere that deals with unexpected circumstances. And I'm going to present to you kind of the mechanical analogs of this. And, they, and I just did. <laughs> so you can think of this side, when you're under predictable situations, you can employ algorithms that look a lot like optimal control. And when you don't know what's going to happen, you can employ algorithms that can be characterized as impedance control mechanically. So what about motor lateralization? Okay, so a lot of stuff I'm gonna present has a setup like this, um, where people move from one point to another. A lot of the studies, they're on a uh, frictionless surface, and we're just characterizing their movements. Now this is like the very early stuff, like 25 years ago, when I didn't want to study handedness. I wanted the two hands to be the same so that I could ask questions about how the brain shares information from one side to the other. But handedness just kept happening. And basically, if you saw somebody make these quick movements, you wouldn't see these differences in curvature that you see up here. They'd look pretty similar. These are really easy movements. But when we ask people to move really fast, you get these differences where the non-dominant hand makes these big directional errors and huge curvatures, and the dominant arm, not so much. And so, you know, you can, you can uh, measure these things, or we measured these things, same velocity, same basic error at the end of movement, but um, differences in direction and curvature. And then when we looked at the inverse dynamics of these movements, we found that the dominant arm was able to use, for in this example, was able to use the inertial interactions that are driven by shoulder motion to make a really nice movement. And the non-dominant arm, red here, I'm sorry, red is uh, muscle torque. For those of you who do inverse dynamics, that's the residual torque. That's the stuff that's not accounted for by other things. And we assume that it's muscle, especially for these movements. And the non-dominant arm is using a lot of muscle torque that it doesn't have to be using. And so we've explored this with inverse dynamics and with four dynamic simulations and with EMG. And over and over and over again, it looks like the non-dominant arm just isn't as energetically efficient 
and so it makes errors. And so when we ask people to move across directions, this is uh, a really old study, but we put both hand paths, left and right, into a right-hand coordinate system. So if you see the left-hand path, you can pretend it's a right hand, it's going like this, and the right-hand path is going like this. And just think about this in terms of inertial dynamics. If you need to accelerate your hand out here, and you first pull your elbow in as you're pushing your shoulder out, then you'll reduce whole, lerm, whole arm inertia, and you'll be able to get there more efficiently. But if you let your elbow go out first, then you'll increase whole limb inertia. So it's just an example. But the cool thing about this is that when we looked at the interaction torque, let's just say amplitude, across hand path curvature, the dominant arm was able to make any direction movements it wanted fairly straight with no dependence, but the non-dominant arm was enslaved to its interaction torque, its inertial dynamics. So if I ask you to go to a whiteboard and just draw a big circle with each arm, your non-dominant arm will draw more of an oval. And the reason is it's not accounting for intersegmental dynamics. So what about movements without intersegmental dynamics? So here's an example of that, something we've known about movements for a long time. That's the shoulder, that's the elbow. You make three movements of three different amplitudes, just single joint movements. And you scale your acceleration profile. This is important because this is 50 milliseconds into the movement, which means that's all predictive. And you scale your velocity profile. And you can see that your accelera acceleration here for single joint movement, right? It's i plus mr squared times um, theta double dot, which is, means that the acceleration profile is just proportional to the torque. And what you can see here is that it crosses zero roughly the same time. The non-dominant hand does something quite different. It initiates movements with pretty much a stereotyped amplitude of acceleration, but it achieves the different velocities and different distances by prolonging the torque profile. So two different control strategies, even with single joint movements, where the dominant arm strategy looks like it's predictive, anticipatory, and probably in some ways optimal, depending on your objective function. So same speed and accuracy movements, no advantage to using one control, um, one control strategy or the other, but the two are controlling things differently, but just as well. All right, enough of that. Uh, that's Sydney Schaefer who did this work. She's down in ASU now. I'm not gonna get into details here. All right. So, you know, the hypothesis was, well, the dominant arm, really the dominant arm controller, the left hemisphere, seems to be really good at being, to make being able to make efficient movements that seem to reflect something that we envision as optimal control. I'll get back to that later with some simulations. But what about the non-dominant arm? So, it, how many people here work with stroke patients? Raise your hand. Okay, a few of you. And how many of you have dealt with aphasia? Have seen it, okay. So, if you are like 98% of the population, then you are said to be left dominant for language. Now, what does this mean? That means that your posterior and superior temporal lobe, if you lesion it, you will lose your lexicon or your your dictionary of words and your syntax or your rules for putting words together. So both in interpreting and expressing words. And there are, I'm not gonna get into that part, but that's left hemisphere. What happens if you lose the right hemisphere, same areas? So if you lose the right hemisphere, what you lose is, what's the big problem with artificial speech? Is it syntax, is it words and sequence? What is it that's really awkward about it? Anybody? Formality. Huh? Formality. Right, intonation's no good. So they try, you know, like Siri tries to add a little bit, but it's usually inappropriate. So if I say, like, like say, let's just take your, your significant other. And if they're in the kitchen, you're in the living room, and they say to you, you know, could you come here a minute? 
or could you come here a minute? That's massive, right? The difference in your life and the difference in meaning, that's the right hemisphere. And that's something that we couldn't figure out yet with artificial intelligence. So it's kind of weird that we call the left hemisphere dominant. Are you better off if you don't have that capability? I don't know, maybe. But anyhow, that's, that's the way lateralization works. But for some reason, people with motor control, they just figured, here's a good hemisphere and a good hand, here's a bad hemisphere and a bad hand. So like, what we started to do was say, no, the non-dominant arm, the non-dominant hemisphere have to be doing something special. And one thing that we noticed is, whoops, is this is Andre Pshebola, who worked with me for a long time as a postdoc, and then a assistant professor. Um, so the circles there represent accuracy. If you have people, this is totally counterintuitive, if you're working on a surface and you have to go to different targets, and you have people use their non-dominant left hand and their dominant right hand, almost all the stuff I'm going to present is on right-handers. How many of you here are left-handers? Anybody? You see? You see? You don't want to work with him. So left-handers, there's a small percentage of left-handers that look neuro neurophysiologically, meaning imaging, you know, EEG. They look a lot like right-handers, but reversed. But the vast majority of left-handers have different neural profiles when you ask them to do tasks, and very different behavioral profiles. So they tend to be mixed-handers, not left-handers. So in trying to figure this out, we're focusing on the roughly 95% of the population, which are right-handers. And anyhow, so what happens is, if you don't have visual feedback, and you move to, like, targets all across the workspace, what happens is that your non-dominant arm is significantly more accurate to getting to the target. That was weird. Even though people will report that they did better with their right hand, even if they get more points with their left hand. And I think that's because with your right hand, because you're using this predictive strategy, you feel more agency in your movement while you're moving. Somebody brought that up before. Agency. Great term. So this is Brooke. Brooke was, uh, she's an OTD, and she's also a PhD. And um, her first study she did with me, we asked, well, maybe the non-dominant arm just does better under unpredictable circumstances. And when you give a whole array of targets, things are unpredictable. But once you start to experience things over and over again, then the dominant arm becomes better. And that's exactly what happened, or at least the same. So the dominant arm disadvantage is because it can't predict, because it doesn't know what's going to happen. So then we started to toy with this. Is a dominant arm specialization predictive control? And the non-dominant arm specialization, we thought when you stop a movement, you know, if you try and simulate just a mechanical system that's like the arm, then you really need to use impedance control, or you have to have really, really accurate force control or torque control. So we figured maybe the non-dominant arm is pretty good at impedance control, which is kind of like what you need to do when you hold things and then you, and then you act on them with your other hand. So the non-dominant arm should perform, according to this hypothesis, better at unpredictable conditions. Now this was kind of, we did a bunch of studies. I'm going to show you one or two. But this was kind of um, uh, uh, at least, I'm not going to, first of all, let's settle on this. All of this is crap. Once we've settled on that, I'll say that this question was pretty cool because, you know, most people's view is that the non-dominant arm is bad, the dominant arm is good. I call it global dominance hypothesis. But, but we thought if this is really lateralized, like brain systems are lateralized, the non-dominant system has to actually be better at something. And so we went with predictable and unpredictable mechanical conditions. And we said, the non-dominant arm is actually going to be better at unpredictable situations. And so this is Vivek Yadav. He works for, I think he's still working for Google. He went into industry. He's rich and happy. Um, so what we did was we gave either an inconsistent field that could vary in amplitude. If we varied it in direction, people really freaked out and didn't do the task. So we just did amplitude. But the other significant thing is that field, so that's, a, that's what they call it a curl field. It's kind of a fake Coriolis force. You move forward, and you have a perpendicular force that varies in amplitude with, in this case, velocity. 
So we figured, ah, what better signal if we think something's an impedance controller and we think that controllable impedance for the neuromechanical system is really, you know, viscos you know fake viscosity or velocity dependence and uh, position dependence or stiffness. So we gave it that field. The consistent field, which we thought would, would be more uh, were better dealt with by the dominant system, we gave it a velocity square field. So you can see the way that it changes more rapidly. And the idea there was that if you're trying to control it with at least a simple, stupid, you know, position uh, viscosity controller, it's not going to be so good at that. And so our hypothesis was that the left non-dominant arm will actually be better than the dominant arm in the inconsistent field and worse in the consistent field. And that's exactly what we found. The dominant arm had lower errors. This is just two measures of error in the consistent field. And the non-dominant arm had lower errors in the inconsistent field. And if that seems weird to you, just imagine that you're a dominant controller and you really know you got this. So you keep trying to use predictive control but the forces keep changing. And so you're actually not going to get that very good until you can understand, which you can't because of the pseudo-random presentations, that the forces are different amplitudes. Non-dominant arm just ramps up its stiffness and viscosity and gets there. So this is what we think is going on. Dominant arm, good at uh, dynamics, predictive control, we'll get to the details of that in a minute. Non-dominant arm impedance control, here's examples of tasks. It's not rocket science. So, uh, one more thing. Is a, is a non-dominant arm actually better in bilateral activities at stabilizing? So this was done with Liz Wojtowicz. Um She went into industry. She's happy. Someday I'll show you somebody that went into academics and is happy. Um, so what we did was we wanted to do these kind of tacks, holding, cutting, you know, holding, nailing, that kind of thing. So what we did is we used this really cheap robot called a spring, and we put it between the sleds, that the air sleds that the arms were on, so you can't feel it. But then we displaced the cursor to the center between the hands, and the instruction was keep your left cursor in the start position and move to the targets with your right hand. So you have to be able to get there with the spring force, which is varying in its direction, because you're varying in your direction relative to the movement. And you have to be able to impede the, string fo the spring force with your stabilizing hand. And so that's what we did. And then we clustered the targets like this, so you know, just for analysis and easy presentation. And this is what we found. Those are the inverse dynamics. Spring forces were the same between the hands. This is a spring force, two hands um, for the different target directions. And you can see up here in the, in the little stick diagrams, just in this example, that the right arm had trouble stabilizing. The left arm had trouble making straight movements to the target. And the left arm was good at stabilizing while the right arm was able to make it to the target against the spring forces. And you can we don't have time to look at the inverse dynamics, but they substantiate that. These are the hand displacements for the stabilizing hand. This is the left, and this is the right arm. So in these movements, you see these differences. And just in a, there's both endpoint compliance and elbow compliance, compliance being you know, one over uh, uh, impedance. And what you can see is that the left arm has higher stiffness, viscosity, or lower compliance um, at the joint level and at the hand level. So we think we have something there that might be right. So the important thing here, now let's talk about control and the brain a little bit. This hypothesis that one hemisphere is controlling one aspect of movement and the other another aspect of movement it's a hybrid hypothesis. So the idea is that each hemisphere is contributing its specialization to each hand, but the hand is going to reflect the bias of its contralateral hemisphere. Due, I don't know, probably due to more direct innervation. I can't really answer the why there. 
So what we did is we did a hybrid control um, um, simulation a model in which we had trajectory torques which were generated by an optimal model, which I'll explain, very simple optimization, and then equilibrium torques, which were just generating forces by specifying an equilibrium uh, position, stiffness, at the end point, and, vis and some viscosity. And we actually used optimizations for each subject to figure out the, the uh, parameters, uh, the constants for, uh, these different controllers. And so the optimal controller considered power, some kind of energy thing, um, position, um, are you at the final position or are you not, and a speed error, are you at zero velocity, which you have to get to or not. And uh, the impedance controller specified stiffness and viscosity. And then we had this combined control where we always started with the optimal controller because you need to start with something. And then we switched over to the impedance controller. And we did this for a whole bunch of movements from a whole bunch of subjects. And this is basically the result. So red is the optimal controller. If we switch to the impedance controller early, then you get this big curved trajectory. And as we switch later and later, we get a straighter and straighter trajectory for these movements. And if we look at actual paths, left-hand paths, you switch early. Right-hand paths, you switch late. I'm not saying that you're using early right, uh, left hemisphere, um, and, then you, and then you incorporate right hemisphere. It's just that the serial nature of this model made it easier to implement. And I think it could be parallel, but uh, like it is during the transition. But we don't really know. So this isn't new. Some of you might know Bob Scheidt. This is my mentor, Claude Guest. They did some work showing separate um, mechanisms for controlling impedance and, and something that looked like optimal control um, or trajectory uh, through learning studies. And now, oh no! So we have this kind of optimal and impedance control. Could it be as simple as feed forward and feedback control? So how are we going to disentangle this? Because impedance control, you can imagine, you probably use reflexes. You probably modulate stretch reflexes. To spe that's a whole theory of control, equilibrium point control. You use stretch reflexes to specify positions that you progressively move through. And maybe we're just talking about feedback and feed forward. That's fine. Open, closed loop. How can we disentangle this? Well, we used human deafferentation. <clears throat> There's been four patients, now I've worked with all of them, um, described in scientific literature. Now there's one more that's uh, in Minnesota. But uh, these patients have large fiber sensory neuropathies, which means 1A and 2 fibers, are they die due to a, post, due to a viral episode. Um, no more have cropped up. This, this happened in these patients somewhere between the, the early 80s and the late 90s. And um, nobody really knows uh, much more about it other than the fact that if you do a serial nerve biopsy, you see these patients have the low diameter fibers but not the large diameter fibers. And they can't sense two-point discrimination and proprioception, but their pain and temperature sensation becomes larger because they don't have the gating mechanism um, in, their, in their spinal cord. Um, and so this is, this is GL. She's not alive anymore, unfortunately. Such a, such a great person. And this is her trying to do, we're, we're sadists, and we asked her to do the slotted pegboard task. And what you can see is it looks a lot like cerebellar damage patient with ataxia. Her movements are very ataxic because she lacks proprioception. And so what we add, asked her to do is just to reach the targets with the left and right arm. So this is uh, Shani Jayasinga uh, up there. Um, she's at Minnesota now. Fabrice Sarlena, who uh, used to be a postdoc with me and now is a professor in Marseille. And this is Jake Schaefer. I'm most proud of him. He left my lab with a PhD, and now he's a brewmaster in Philadelphia. Um, so this is actually what happened. And this is, you know, these bar graphs, just, they're just to show you that what I'm going to tell you is 
significant, but this is what happened. The non-dominant arm moved out around the target and then oscillated like a weak spring with a set point. And the dominant arm moved out and then drifted. It never stopped. And if we actually calculated which arm did better at the initial movement accuracy, the dominant arm, which arm did better at the average position at the end, the non-dominant arm. So we couldn't believe this. So this is, so if you don't have your large sensory fibers like GL, then if you don't have vision, you have no idea where your arm is. So you, you can look at a target and you can specify what you're gonna do, but you have no idea what your arm's doing. You don't have sensory feedback about it. So everything is feed forward. And we're getting a difference in the two types of controllers in this feed forward system. So it's not just feed forward and feedback. Neither of the control systems are very accurate with her, but there's this massive difference. So uh, just to kind of tie up loose ends, we did a simulation that's much like the simulation that uh, I showed you previously, where we have a series system where we start out with a optimal controller and end up with an impedance controller. And we basically were able to get something that looked a lot like what people did, or uh, what she did. So, um, you know, it's, you know, simulations, they, <laughs> they don't mean much, but it means that it's plausible, that our hypothesis is at least plausible, even if it's garbage. So now I'll tell you about mechanisms of pathology. So if both hemispheres are contributing different things to each arm, if you have a lesion that euphemistically gets rid of one hemisphere, then your contralesional arm becomes paretic. But you lost the contributions of that hemisphere to the good arm. And so what we did first was we just looked to see if we got hemispheric differences in the errors that people would generate in their good arm. So we took people with left hemisphere damage. These are the lesion overlap plots. This work was done with Sidney Schaefer and Kathy Holland, a friend and colleague in the VA system, used to be, she's retired now, in New Mexico. And we you know, got matched overlays of the lesions. These are obviously big middle cerebral artery strokes. And so these people had significant um, hemiparesis. And this is what happened. These are just like examples up here. You can see that the healthy controls generally move straight. There's little differences in their movement. These are older people. They're moving pretty slow. So they're not analogous to the early things that I showed you where young people are moving really fast to targets. We see big differences. But what you can see here is that left hemisphere damaged people have problems. They, they look more curved in their movements. Right hemisphere damaged patients look straighter, but they have trouble stopping at the target. And if we look across subjects at the variability at peak velocity versus the variability at the end, this is the left hemisphere damaged patients where they have more variability starting their movement than ending their movement, and right, um, less variability starting more variability at the end. And this is a quantification of that across subjects. So that was pretty consistent. This was one of the first studies we did. So then we asked, for those of you that don't have a good grasp of neuroanatomy, we're gonna look at four parts of the brain, the front, the back, the left, and the right. Pretty easy. And we're gonna look at this task. This is a visual motor rotation task where your hand goes one way, the cursor goes the other. Now, we did this in eight directions, so if you pay attention to the people in motor learning literature, they get all upset over what's um, implicit and what's explicit in this learning. If you do lots and lots of directions around a circle in a center out task, it's almost all implicit, and we know that because when you're doing it and you programmed it and you take away the rotation, you make a big after effect. If you're just doing one direction, you can do the whole thing. You can say, oh, I'm going to move to here instead of here. But anyhow, that's, that's what it looks like. And here we got focal lesions. If you can imagine this, we were able to compare left frontal damage to left um, posterior damage, parietal, right frontal to right posterior damage. And the results that we got were pretty intriguing. Right frontal damage 
gave us position deficits early on in the learning and uh, trajectory advantages. And right parietal damage looked just like controls. Left frontal damage looked just like controls, but gave us trajectory deficits, or how straight you move to the movement, in left, you know, left parietal and position advantages. So you made these very curved movements, but they curved back to the target appropriately and even better than controls early on. So we ended up with this double dissociation between lesion and deficit, whoops, sorry, where right hemisphere frontal damage gave us position deficits, and that was pretty much the, uh, the uh, 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 dorsolateral prefrontal area. And the parietal damage, uh, damage gave us trajectory deficits and actually position advantages. So it was a really, it was a really uh, uh, strong double dissociation. Now what about the contralesional arm? We did a few studies, but this one's where we took the focal lesions like I showed you before, and we looked at learning, and what we found was, so the contralesional arm, when you have focal posterior damage, you don't have any problems that can be characterized as hemiparesis with your arms because you don't have um, uh, anterior parietal or, or posterior frontal damage. And the, uh, the lesions totally wiped out adaptation in the, uh, uh, in the patients, uh, in the contralesional arm patients with left uh, damage, but people with right parietal damage look just like controls. People with right parietal, da uh, parietal damage showed after effects, and uh, the patients with uh, left posterior damage showed no after, after effect is when you have a force, so you have like a, a perturbation like this, and so you're making these nice movements, and then you take the force of the perturbation away, and you make a movement that looks like the opposite of when you were first introduced to the force, because you're compensating for something that's not there anymore. It's a reflection of learning. So it turns out the left imperial parietal lobule, I mean, I know these are crazy. It's almost like front, back, left, right. Um, anatomists called the thing under the interparietal sulcus the parietal lobule, big chunk of cortex. So uh, it's critical for adaptation. And what we wanted to ask was, is this true just for visual motor rotation adaptation, or is it also for something that we characterize as skill learning? And so this is the part that I threw in here for you guys because you like electricity. Um, so let me just characterize two things. Motor adaptation, what is it? You know, you see it, people do these force fields. They introduce people to visual motor rotations like we did or something like that. It's a perturbation. And so adaptation is thought to be when you take some movement that you're really good at, like just reaching the targets, and then you introduce some kind of perturbation, what you do with adaptation is you practice until you mitigate the perturbation, the effects of the perturbation so that you produce the movement that has the characteristics of your unperturbed movement previously. That's adaptation. Something that we think of as skill learning is when you've never done the task before. You start out with large errors, there's no baseline, and you just get better and better with practice. And so we did these two things. First thing we did is we used anodal. So we were really interested in whether you could use anodal um, TDCS. This is with a, with a five electrode system, it's supposed to be a little bit more focused. Um, and these are the models that suggest that the array that we used had a pretty similar distribution to our focal lesions in the previous study that I showed. And so when we did this, we're in the middle of these studies, by the way, um, we first looked at visual motor rotation and we looked at adaptation and transfer. So when you transfer to the other hand, it's a immediate reflection of motor consolidation. Motor consolidation is when you remember something about your movement that's just not the instance of movement. So you can generalize it and it tends to last longer. And one of the most immediate ways to sample it is interlimb transfer because the memory there is non-effector specific. So it's something more than just the memory of the rote thing that you did. And so we sampled that 
And uh, then in motor skill learning, we basically did the same thing. And these are our results. And just quickly, with motor adaptation, we had three conditions, stimulation conditions. Um, we had left posterior parietal cortex, right posterior parietal cortex, and sham. Sham is green. There was basically no difference in learning, but there was a massive difference in transfer. These are really big effects for these types of studies. That's adaptation. And then for skill learning, left gave us more rapid and possibly a larger extent of learning and a very transient effect of anything on transfer. So what's cool is left posterior parietal cortex seems to be important for both adaptation and skill learning, but has slightly different effects. The fact that right and left posterior parietal cortex stimulation gave us different effects where right looked just like sham, you know, pretty good control. Um, all right, so I just wanted to throw that in so you could see this garbage we're doing. Um, so let me just say one more thing about skill and adaptation. I think that when you learn a task that you, like anybody here ever play pickleball? Hands, pickleball. Okay, so pickleball, you learn to play because it's easy, you get old like me, you don't have to move so fast. Um, but what's it like? It's like tennis. Is it exactly like tennis? No. So you're adapting certain components of it from tennis, and then you're learning new aspects of it. So that's adapting and skill. And that's what we think that you do when you learn new motor tasks, adaptation and skill learning all in one. And if we can stimulate posterior parietal cortex on the left side to affect both hands and improve rate of learning and or transfer, Maybe it'll have implications for facilitating response to rehabilitation. So clinical intervention, what? So we started out, uh, I'm gonna start out telling you about the functional deficits in the uh, less impaired arm, so the ipsilesional arm. These are people that I worked with. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, these are just the groups that we had, mild, moderate, and severe, and the Fugelmeyer, which is a pretty easy clinical test to give, and everybody agrees on what the different scores. This is the upper limb Fugelmeyer that goes up to 66. Everybody agrees with what they mean, and Liz Wojtowicz did some work where she did cluster analysis and recommended some ranges to characterize people as severe, moderate, or mild. And so we looked at functional deficits in the good arm of stroke patients. These are control subjects, and they're age matched. And these are the times that they complete the Jebs and Taylor hand function test. You can see the items up there. You move things around. You do fine things. Um, and it's thought to be a pretty good test uh, that corresponds to how well you do with activities of daily living. And so these, these are what control subjects do. This is the dominant hand, non-dominant hand. Here's people with mild stroke. They are mild deficits due to stroke, and they show significant differences from controls. Um, moderate, even more, and severe, even more. Worse in this study if you have left hemisphere damage than right hemisphere damage. But what this means is that when you have severe damage, what is that? I mean, severe impairment, that means that you can't open and close your hand. A lot of you are working with, I saw a lot of people today working with uh, FES to be able to get people to be able to open and close their hand when they have uh, severe hemiparesis. So you can't open and close your hand functionally. You don't have the FES system. So you basically can't do your ADLs with that hand. So you have this hand. So you have a hand, now you have to do your ADLs unilaterally and you have deficits. It takes you twice as long to complete tasks and you don't complete them very well. So this is a problem. So can anything be done to improve them? Well, what we did in a, uh, in a first attempt at this was we designed a virtual reality task. We had people essentially play computer games that either taxed the, uh, the uh, 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 different 
components of control that we thought were related to left hemisphere. So this is like the skill task that I showed you before, a shuffleboard task where you hit something and it goes into the target. I don't think I explained that to you. And, the, and a tracing task where you have to specify your trajectory continuously during the movement. And then we had them do a whole bunch of um, real life tasks to train dexterity. And so uh, this was, the, the COVID kind of screwed up. We were gonna do a crossover, but we couldn't do it. So we had a training period one where we trained the good arm. We had a training period two, which ended up being sham. So we were gonna do a crossover and reverse those, but we weren't able to do that. And then we did a retention and there were three weeks in between these. And this is what we found, which was pretty dramatic for, uh, what would we have 13 patients with severe paresis with their good hand they got better at the Jibs and Taylor hand function test and they kept that. So that's good. Now this is the amazing thing, the FIM they got better at. So the FIM, raise your hand if you ever heard of the FIM. It's a self-report for uh, functional independence. What can you do? Can you do toileting by yourself? You know, do you need help with it? Can you do your, you know, your brush your teeth, all the, all the hygiene stuff? Can you put your clothes on? Can you take care of making a sandwich, feeding yourself, that kind of thing? It is self-report, but it's the best we got. And it's really rare for a stroke intervention study to get you better at that. But this makes perfect sense. The bad hand, if you will, they can't use for their ADLs. The good hand was dysfunctional and and had terrible dexterity. We trained dexterity, so they got better. And we asked them open-endedly, like what, has anything changed? And I remember this one patient and his wife kind of went and she said, he can go in the bathroom by himself in the morning now. So it makes a big difference. Now the Fugelmeyer got a few points better, not, not statistically significant, but not clinically significant. And I think it's just that they did more in their days. Um, so we're in the middle of a big two sate trial um, where with my friend Carolee Winstein, who many of you might know, and you might know she retired, but she's still working with us. We already collected all the data, um, and now this year we're gonna analyze it, but we compared conventional paretic arm training to non-paretic arm training. We think the non-paretic arm training in the severe stroke patients is actually gonna translate to functional independence more. Now, you might say, oh my God, it's the wrong arm, what are you doing? We're not advocating that you ignore the paretic arm. We're advocating that this is the whole person and if they have deficits in their good arm, it can really impact their functional independence and we can get them better. So the, you know, the bottom line is functioning in everyday life. So our approach is test and remediate both limbs. It's not the wrong arm. And there's the people I worked with and thank you very much. Great. Okay. Are there questions? There's got to be questions. Why did you do this crap? Yes. Yeah, so Steve Wolf, good friend of mine, in the beginning of this, he's like, what are you doing? It's like, it's cool. So did you look at or you consider which hand is paretic? <laughs> oh, left to right, I'm sorry. I thought you were saying, could we identify the paretic hand? Thanks. Um, yeah, I know so what you're saying. So you mean the intervention, like the other stuff? Right, yeah, we were so always dealing with the ipsilesian arm. The intervention so the, yeah, the in the intervention, right we in the first one we only had 13 subjects, um, and we had uh, we had no differences between right. We had about 50-50 right and left hemisphere damage, but you can see the interventions targeting, you know, each. Uh, each hemisphere's deficits, if you will, or 
hemisphere specific deficits. So we didn't expect differences. We didn't see them in that pilot study. We don't know. Yes, we're keeping that as a factor to be analyzed in the big intervention. The big intervention has 60 patients. It was supposed to have 120, but COVID. So uh, that really messed us up. But I think 60, we're going to have enough power. And yeah, we'll know. The kind of cool thing there is we already know because it was pre-randomization data, we know that our two groups had the same level of ipsilesional deficit when we started. So um, as opposed to that study that I showed you where left hemisphere damage patients seem to have greater deficits. So that might be you know, that particular group that we studied. But yeah, we're, we'll look at that. I don't know what we'll find. Um, so I have a question about the stroke patient that you're using. Uh, are all of them right-handed? Like you all of them were premorbidly right-handed. Yeah. So did, was that part of your like uh, inclusion criteria? Inclusion criteria, yeah. I mean, it, we decided after in the second study where we had more, we decided afterwards if somebody was left-handed but they fit all the other criteria, we'd take them. And then if we're lucky, we'll have enough. But we ended up with like two patients that were left-handed. It's really, you know, you got to figure you got like five, seven, eight percent of the population that are left handed. And then we've got this strict inclusion criteria in our stroke patients. So the possibility of getting left handers, you know, enough to have power to address the question of whether it matters um, is pretty low. And the other question is about uh, one of the graphs that you show us, you showed that the people who have severe impairment in their arm, they took longer to finish the task with their uh, good arm or the non paratic arm. And my question is like when somebody has a severe uh, damage or severe uh, stroke, it's not like the good arm is a good arm anymore. The damage, it's one of the arm will have more uh, impairment compared to the other. So w was that something that you tested in terms of like to see the function of the, what you call like what, the good arm? Yeah, so severity of, first of all, the, the intervention studies, both of them we restricted to severe impairment only. So we're really interested in when you can't use this arm, you know, how important is it to address this arm? Um, but severity of impairment is, is a factor in our analysis that we will, be, uh, we will be looking at whether it moderates the response. Yeah. And things like apraxia and general cognitive status, um, phasia, those are all uh, factors that could be moderators too. Anything else? Um, about your TDS, uh, TDCS, uh, stimulus, yeah. what, what, what was the montage? Did you use like bilateral? Did you use uh, an odal? Like what type of... Uh, like we used, and, uh, so uh, Pratik Muta, who I had up there, a previous student of mine, he wanted to reproduce our lesion findings and he used cathodal to left and right and showed only cathodal to left inhibited, same thing, visual motor learning. And so we're interested in the, you know, uh, translational potential for stimulating posterior parietal cortex to facilitate motor learning and rehab, since we know it's a big part of rehab. And so we used anodal stimulation, you know, which, you know, theoretically um, should produce maybe a small increase in excitability of the targeted area. And that facilitated the behavior, which is also kind of amazing because there's no reason why, you know, excitation or inhibition of cortical area should have some predictable effect on the related behavior. But it did. It facilitated different aspects of the behavior depending on whether it was skill or uh, adaptation learning. And we thought that was pretty, you know, it's weird. We can't explain why in skill learning it's in the initial phase um, more than the transfer and in adaptation, it's more in the transfer, the initial phase. We've, we've followed this up and it looks like pretty repeatable findings. So that'll take some thought. We're also doing um, double pulse TMS from the same areas um, to try and figure out whether, you know, try and dissociate whether the effect is on motor planning, so doing it just prior to movement 
or in the correction phase, so doing it in the deceleration phase of movement. And we're seeing that, at least for adaptation, what's important is the between trial stimulation or something that probably has to do with consolidating the motor memory from the previous movement. But who knows? Anything else? Okay, thank you very much.